Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Reading the Room, a discussion series in which I am joined by a bookish guest to talk about something bookish. And today I am joined by Lillian Fishman, author of the debut novel, Acts of Service, out now from Hogarth. And it's actually this month's pick for my book club, aptly titled The Bar and the Book Club. Lillian, thank you so much for joining me. This is one of the best novels I've read this year, and I'm so excited to chat with you. Thank you so much. I'm so touched. So before we get into the meat of the novel, can you give us a brief synopsis of the book? Yeah, very brief synopsis uh, is that the novel's about a young woman. Her name is Eve, and uh, she ends up getting involved with a straight couple um, who actually work together, a man and a woman, and their relationship is emotionally and ethically complicated uh and it goes from there yeah and so, much away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a lot to be discovered in this book um and as you mentioned the the novel focuses on the power dynamics of this love triangle composed of eve olivia and nathan and so upon you know embarking on this novel did the story begin with a certain character or a theme or how did that sort of start for you yeah that's an interesting question that i've been thinking about lately the book did start as the relationship between these three characters but it started out um feeling a lot more focused on the relationship between eve and olivia so that was sort of the initial idea that I went in with and that interested me about this situation was exploring Eve's anxieties about her sexuality in a situation where she's sort of being witnessed by and having to answer to another woman in the room. You know, I felt like a central thematic heart of what I wanted to do and what I was writing was think about, you know, for this character who's a queer person, a bisexual person who has a lot of social and ethical hangups about heterosexuality or about attraction to cis men, I wanted to put her in a situation where that wasn't private. That was something that she was sort of like having to grapple with in front of another woman and like own up to. And so even though Olivia isn't really the person forcing her to grapple with it, Olivia is just a foil a completely different way of, of interacting with the situation and a different way of thinking about it than the one that Eve is using. It started out being about the two of them sort of watching each other in this situation with Nathan. And then as the book developed, of course, you can feel that it became necessarily much more about the relationship between Eve and Nathan than I, than I originally supposed. Yeah, that's really interesting because the, the action and the narrative progression of this novel is mostly, in my opinion, propelled by many of the conversations that Eve has with Olivia and Nathan as this is a first person perspective in, in the novel. And so it's contrasted with, so we have the dialogue and then it's contrasted with Eve's interiority. And so how did you approach writing dialogue as to move the novel forward? And how did that dialogue inform Eve's reflections on the dynamics with the two other characters here? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't, I don't remember I mean, I know I can tell you sort of two things about how the bulk of it got written. I definitely wrote the scenes between the three of them first. I wrote them pretty quickly over three or four months in like the second half of 2018. Um, and I remember using the dialogue between them in order to sort of try and work out on the page a lot of the internal conversations or arguments I was having with myself or with friends. Um, but I, I also had to work pretty hard to have it not feel overly didactic. Um, and I remember that probably the toughest thing to work out in terms of the form and the structure and how it feels to read through those scenes was, um, the proportion of dialogue to Eve's interiority and which parts should be spoken and which parts should be felt and thought for her. And I think that ratio and where things go really changed. Like I didn't write the novel in order. I wrote all of these scenes between them. There's about four major scenes between them. And then once I laid it out as a novel and filled in some gaps, I had to think about like, okay, actually, this is too early in the novel for this to be a subject that she would feel comfortable actually 
asking Nathan about or talking to them about. This has to be something that in the first 50 or 100 pages she thinks about when she's with them, but she's too shy to talk about. And then later it's something that can come through in the dialogue explicitly and change shape. It took a lot of sort of fooling around and planning in the later stages to figure out like where things should erupt in the dialogue, you know? Yeah, no, that's so interesting to think about it from a more like macro sense, because to me, when I was reading this book, it's so immediately immersive. While it's on one hand interior in terms of being inside Eve's mind, it's also quite contained within this one relationship throughout the entire novel. And so it's interesting thinking about how you mentioned how you wrote certain aspects and then like thinking about it later and piecing it all together. It's, I just think it's fascinating from a craft perspective hearing you speak on how that all came together for you because as it reads so seamlessly. So all I have to say, I think it's done so, so well. Thank you. Thank you. It took a long time and uh, I'm really glad it feels that way. Yeah. And so while the plot is propelled in essence, by the sexual dynamics of the characters. To me, the root of this novel feels like an examination of selfhood for Eve and the consequences of her own personal choices. And so at the beginning of the novel, we learn that Eve makes the choice to cheat on her girlfriend. Her name's Romy. Yet Eve does not seem preoccupied with the morality of this decision really throughout the novel. Rather, it seems like she's focused on her own autonomy and her own desire, which we learn to be merely to be seen by Olivia and Nathan in this dynamic even when it seems throughout the novel that they're manipulating Eve for their own gain or their own relationship between Olivia and Nathan. Can you discuss how you approach writing Eve's exploration of this desire as an act of service for her own self-determination throughout the novel? Yeah, it's interesting. People always ask me about this. They always are like, it's so strange that she isn't more anxious about cheating on Romy and especially people who aren't American always are like, why does it matter that Nathan and Olivia work together? No one, it's a big deal that she cheats on Romy, but it's not a big deal that they have this sort of illicit workplace relationship. And I, th I think um, it is true that all of the ethical questions in the novel are extremely relative. Uh, in fact, the most central anxiety that Eve has, which is about like, her own interest in a man in Nathan, which is like the most conventional run of the mill thing that most novels include and there's no anxiety about it at all in them. Uh, they're all really relative questions. And I think basically the novel is just, you know, which things Eve worries about and what she prioritizes are really just a reflection of what interested me. Like what's at stake or it, at a, a main question in the novel is never like, is Eve a good person, right? Because if the question is, is Eve a good person, there would be a lot of anxiety about something like cheating on Romy and not a lot of anxiety about like whether or not she fucks a guy. And so the question that is really motivating her is like, you know, is she the is she the person that she understands herself to be? Does she have the desires and values that she grew up thinking that she had and she came of age feeling that she had and identifying with? Um, and she's just sort of uninterested in the question of loyalty. And she's really interested in, I don't know, like social identity and what her choices say about her as like a citizen of the world, I guess. I'm certain, I, I, I will say, I don't know whether it's relevant or not. I will say that I, as a, as a person, am very interested in the question of loyalty. And in fact, I, I certainly write about it and think about it now. And I think if I wrote the same book, you know, now rather than four years ago, it's possible that he would have more anxiety or care toward the way that she thinks about her relationship with Romy. But, you know, it just didn't have nearly the same weight in that period that I was trying to explore what, what Nathan represents to her. Yeah, that's so interesting you mentioned that. You sort of already answered like my next question, but the reason why I asked about that aspect of the morality in the novel is because I feel like I myself, I'm an online like book reviewer. I'm on Instagram and YouTube and I read Goodreads reviews. And I feel like a lot of contemporary discussion around books such as this is 
I find that sometimes it's surface level and just asking the question of whether like, if you read this book, are you going to love these characters or are you, are you going to hate them? And what does that mean for like, I guess, enjoyment of novels? And so I, I think the, the better questions are those in which we, we don't dissect the likability of a character, rather actually understanding kind of how they're composed. And I think the things you're mentioning are really interesting because in the novel, I think it's doing something that a lot of my favorite novels are doing is looking at the human desire for structure. And so, for example, two of my favorite books that I've read recently are Motherhood by Sheila Hetty and Fake Accounts by Lauren Euler. And to put them simply, like motherhood is this looking at the question of motherhood as a, as a human structure for how it can frame your life and the choice not to be a mother. What does that mean? And then also Fake Accounts is a very internet novel and how does like social media and the facade that we present online, how does that structure one's life? And in this book, I, I loved it so much because it's really this look at Eve thinking about sex and desire as a personal structure for herself. And for this one section of the book, when Eve reflects on her envy of religious people and their code to determine what they want and their path forward. And so, and in contrast, Eve uses sex, as I mentioned, to structure her life, at least in this period of the novel. And so how did you choose sex as sort of the foundation for for the novel and Eve's decision making? Yeah, the parallel that you make is so interesting. And, and I think that's also one of the things that most interests me uh, in, in novels and in literature is the question about how you structure your life. And it might be obvious that I'm a huge fan of Sheila Hetty and I think both motherhood and uh, how should a person be are so explicitly about that question. I didn't choose it consciously, the question of sex for how to structure it. I think that as a writer, I'm always thinking about that question, right? Like I, I feel like everything I've ever written and, and most people's novels and certainly acts of service could also be called how should a person be? Like that's really the question that's at the heart of what I think any novel is about or a good novel. It was just obvious to me with the questions that I was worried about that sex was the theater for it. Like, I, mean, I guess it isn't obvious. I guess there might have been a way to do this that was more about attraction and less about explicit sex. This could have been a book, I suppose, about Eve watching movies or celebrities or going on dates or watching porn and thinking about the structure of her attraction and where it came from and how she's going to respond to it. But I think I wanted her to be put in a situation that forced her to face the questions that made her most uncomfortable about herself. Yeah, I think, you know, the question in my mind at the time that I was working on it was really about how sexuality is formed and what it means about you. And I had been, you know, coming of age, like as a queer person in a women's college environment, like in a social setting where how you identified sexually and like expressed that and what your plans were for how to structure your sexual and relational life was like very meaningful and it had a political charge. And so it was just clear to me that that was the question that I wanted to get at in acts of service. It certainly isn't the question that I think is, is most meaningful when you're asking yourself about how to structure a life in general or writing a novel about that. In fact, I've been thinking a lot in the last couple of years about like friendship as, as a sort of basis around, around how to structure a life and a novel, which is so different and so much more like, I think actually relational as opposed to personal, like this isn't always true, but there's something about sex in acts of service that is not really about intimacy. It's much more about identity. And I think that's just because it's about being so young and discovering yourself at someone else's hands. I mean, that's why the close of the book is so much about like what Nathan has provided for her rather than about the strength of their real connection. I mean, I remember so near the end of the book in which they're talking about something that Nathan said to Olivia and Eve is um, challenging you is not the same as violating you. And I think it's interesting the way you speak about sex in this novel is about, in a sense, self-discovery through it. And I think that's why I enjoyed the interior section so much. And it's interesting thinking about Eve and Olivia as sort of foils to each other. And Olivia is a character that I constantly think about. And I think it's because there's a sense of mystery from her perspective in this dynamic. I mean, we kind of understand her desires and 
how she's thinking about the situation in terms of her intimacy with Nathan and how she's performing in this way, in part at least to satisfy what he's asking her to do. And so I'm just wondering how you crafted Olivia, because Eve at one point she says, um, this is a quote, she says, but she continued to fascinate me. I felt toward her now the way one might toward a celebrity, intensely curious, distant and admiring, yet without any hope of reciprocal interest. And it's funny because I think the reader is put in a very similar position, of course, as it's told from Eve's perspective. And so how did you go about thinking about Olivia's desires and crafting her as a character in contrast with Eve? Yeah, you know, Olivia is a mystery to me too. I been thinking about this question a lot and for example it would be impossible for me to write the book from Olivia's perspective it's not as though I I know it and I kept it from you I think Olivia represents a type of womanhood that I've encountered it's so different from my experience or even the experiences of my friends but I've encountered it and I really felt envious of it and also suspicious of it at the same time like I think I feel in the book very similarly to the way Eve articulates feeling about Olivia, which is that there's something about the way that she's able to accept and dive into the relationship and how fearlessly and unself-critically she follows her own interests. Like, she doesn't believe that her choices are political or matter to anyone other than her. And the thing that's so compelling to me about a character like that or about a person like that is that she's right. I mean, she's right and Nathan's right, right? Like in order for a character in a novel to be a good person, they have to care about these things. They have to care about what their actions mean politically and whether they're a betrayal of their values or of other people. And they have to feel that you know, their choices have real meaning in the world. And the thing is that actually, from one perspective, and I think there's a lot of reality in it, Eve's anxieties about the ethics or politics or meaning of what she's doing are totally irrelevant. Like the three of them have a personal relationship that has no impact on anyone else. It only matters to the three of them. It's entirely voluntary. It's entirely private. And it doesn't have any impact in the world. It doesn't have any impact on other people. It actually isn't nearly as fraught as Eve imagines it is. And there's a huge ego to her feeling that this is so meaningful and it's going to construct who she is and what her life means in the future. And I think there's something really compelling to me about Olivia feeling so actually sane about the smallness and the privacy of what she's doing. It's not small to her. It's an enormously meaningful experience to her, I think, in the structure of the novel, we're given to understand that it's a larger part of her life, much larger than it is Eve's. But I think that her handle on it is, it's healthier in a way. It feels dismissive or self-involved, but what else is an intimate relationship, you know? Like Eve's determination to interpret what's happening to her in this larger context is sort of obsessive. And Olivia, you know, she has her neuroses, obviously, but I think she just has a very profound conception of the personal. And I think that's exactly what Eve is trying to learn from her and from Nathan. That's brilliant. Um, and it's really helping me think through some, some more questions I had about this novel, because I think it's interesting what you're saying about how this dynamic is, is interior between the three of them. It's consensual, voluntary, as you mentioned. And I think it's interesting putting these questions of morality and ethics over what they're doing, because in essence, this is a novel and Eve is the narrator of this novel and trying to answer some sort of question through it. And Olivia seems to, to have those answers. And I think it's also interesting thinking about how, as this is a trio dynamic that's being observed by a reader and how the external becomes kind of literal in terms of reading this novel and putting judgments on what's going on in it, in contrast with the actual experience I'm talking about these characters as if it's, it's a real thing, but I don't know, it's, it's, it's this interesting contrast in my mind of how this relationship is viewed externally and sort of from Eve's perspective and trying to get answers to these questions while Olivia seems a little bit more assured in her approach to it. And I think it's interesting thinking about the narration that Eve brings to it with that contrast. And I, I think it's really enjoyable reading a sort of mysterious entity that is Olivia in this dynamic. I don't have a question from that. And I feel like I'm not making sense, but all that to say, I just think it, it works brilliantly. And it's interesting thinking about it from a, again, like a macro sense. I think that 
you're right and I think that part of it is I'm as I'm talking about Olivia like this I'm making it sound as though she's like this incredibly secure wise mature person and and obviously you've read the book that's not really what it is I think it has to do with the fact that like I think that Olivia sort of conceptualizes what's happening to her as I don't think she conceptualizes herself as having the same degree of agency and choice and controlling what's happening to her and being responsible for it. Like so often the way that she engages with the relationship is needy or abandoned or confused or anxious. And it's as though like he just needs to sort of be reassured or taken care of or shown loyalty or shown love. Like she just is in more of a relationship of like need, whereas it does feel like Eve is in in much more of a relationship of choice. And that's partly partly why I think she feels so much responsibility is because I don't think she really feels that like she's reliant on Nathan or indebted to him in the same way. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. I, I remember this one part in the novel where I think Eve asks Olivia why she thanks Nathan so much. And she says, like, what else? Would, I don't want to misquote the novel, but it says like, what, what else would I say? Like, aren't you grateful as well for what he's giving? Interesting dynamic between the two. But another question on this front is how you just generally approach sex writing in fiction and wh what do you think makes for good writing about sex versus bad it's such a hard question and I don't I don't feel that I've figured it out a friend of mine when I was workshopping this novel a close friend once teased me about the sex in the novel and she said Eve is always frantic jelly by which she she was saying like she was joking that that this, she didn't think the sex in the novel read like it was good sex not that it was bad writing but that it seemed as though the sex was bad and the reason it seemed as though the sex was bad was because Eve was always frantic and not in control of her body. And I said to her, I think that's how you know it's good sex. We really were laughing about that because I guess I think the marks of it are, you know, sex, I mean, people always say this about it, but it is true. Like, I think sex writing is just relational writing in a bedroom context. So I think what makes it good is like a real attention to how it's transforming the dynamic between the characters and and inside them. And I hope all of those sex scenes in the novel are really moving things inside Eve and things between her and, and Nathan especially. I think it's successful, obviously. <laughs> so I'm just I'm very curious to hear from your perspective how, how you approach that. The last question on the meat of this novel is this question of Nathan. I do think it's interesting how by the end of this book, or I guess I should start by saying, upon learning more about this dynamic from the start, I myself as a reader approached it with some hesitancy about what he's doing in this dynamic. But I think by the end of it, it doesn't really feel like an indictment of Nathan. And I, I've seen certain reviews or thoughts about this book in terms of saying Nathan's toxic or he's horrendous. I'm curious to know what you think about Nathan. And I mean, me personally, I didn't really get that by the end of it. And I think it's, it's interesting how Eve in her narration, even up to the final page, how she thinks about Nathan's, what he brought to her as an act of service and her own self-determination in a sense. So how did you think about Nathan by, by the end of this novel? Yeah, people have really varied responses to him and a lot of people have a lot of, yeah, I think discomfort or hatred toward him. I can admit to you freely that I love, I love Nathan by the end of the book. And I think you know, I intend the end of the book not to really give anything away, but I intend for that ending and how the sort of source of the interrogation switches, like, I intend that to really implicate, you know, shift the narrative so that all of the characters are implicated and, and no one is culpable for all of the the ethical quandaries in the book. Like, it, I certainly don't think that Nathan isn't a morally flawed person, but all three of them are, certainly. I do hope by the end of the book, even though I can certainly understand why not all readers feel this way, I do hope by the end of the book that you feel forgiving toward Nathan in a way. I mean, I think a really essential, crucial element is that Eve chooses her relationship with him again and again, and so does Olivia. I, you know, I think it's very important the line where she says I don't remember in what scene but Eve says to us that you know if she had ever walked away he would have let her easily for me it's it's hard to fault a person a character in that position a person who's just allowing himself to be in a relationship you know mm -hmm. we don't we certainly don't know that that's universally true I mean the situation that Nathan's involved in at work by the end 
end of the novel is certainly more ethically dark and complicated than that. And it's never clear to us whether or not he's responsible for that or whether or not the accusation is true or complete. But I can freely admit that I do sort of think that the essential quality of a novel has to be forgiving and generous toward the humanity of its characters. You know, I think a novel that that fails to do that is uh, is quite a cold one. No, I agree. And, and my favorite writer, Otessa Moshveg, this book kind of had similar tones and, and your approach to writing these characters that I really enjoyed. That brings me to my final question. I ask everyone this. It's just basically for three book recommendations. So the first one is a book that you're currently reading, two, a book that you recently read and enjoyed, and then three, a book that you're looking forward to reading this year, whether it's an upcoming release or just a book that's on your on your stack. Yes. Okay. Currently reading, I just started reading a book by Rachel Cusk. I'm a huge Rachel Cusk fan. I haven't completed her whole collection everything she's uh, written yet, but I'm, I've read pretty widely from different eras in her work. And right now I'm reading this book, The Last Supper, which was recently reissued, but I think it was originally printed in the early 2000s. It's a travel journal, quite a, I think an unconventional travel journal about a summer in Europe. A book I recently read and enjoyed, Disorientation by Elaine Chu. I think it's in it's pretty brand new. Um, yeah. It has like that pink cover. Yeah, it is really, really smart and wonderful. It's like so, so not the type of book that I would normally pick up um, primarily because it's a satire. You can kind of tell from the tone in acts of service that I'm like a pretty earnest reader and writer and not particularly interested in satire. There's a lot of like big beloved satires that I can't get into. The thing really interesting about disorientation is that I really felt by the end that in completely different ways, it is tackling something very similar to acts of service. It feels as though the book through a completely different set of, of interests is really about how you reconcile yourself to your identity and your desires when you've been socialized into a lot of like self-hatred and confusion about them. And it even structures itself in some similar ways in scenes of interrogation and, and legal settings, but it's it's much more about reconciling those things um, racially rather than in terms of orientation. It is very interesting. Oh, a book I'm looking forward to. Oh, I'm really looking forward to the new Elif Boschman book, Either Or. I'm really excited to read it. Me too. Yeah, those are all three on my TBR. I started collecting um those nice white Rachel Cusk, the new editions that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are all on my list too. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a lovely chat and I'm excited to talk with my book club at the end of the month too. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. It was lovely to meet you and thank you for the really thoughtful questions. I so appreciate it.